Hello, Monetization Nation. Today, I am here live at Funnel Hacking Live, my favorite digital marketing conference of the year. And I am here with Anthony Trux, who is one of the amazing speakers that we all get to hear from. Anthony is a former NFL athlete, an America Ninja Warrior from NBC. He's the host of the Aw Shift podcast, author of, of multiple books, such as Identity Shift, and he's the founder of Identity Shift Coaching. Thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, yeah, no problem. You caught me after a workout and breakfast. Good time. <laughs> yeah, it all works out. Can you start off by sharing with us something that you are super passionate about? Hmm. Family, man. Very yeah, passionate about family. Definitely. I'm in what I call season of bed right now. Yeah. Which, which is everything in life still goes on, but it's the season of being a dad priority first. That's right. Uh, so kids take breaks. Like I'll be actually here today. I flew in yesterday. I'm on a flight tonight out. Everybody else will be here for the entire week, but I'm yeah. like, ah, I gotta go home. I have. I have my son's football team to coach. Like that stuff takes priority right now. So I love it. that's what I'm passionate about. I love how kids help put everything else in perspective. Yeah, I mean, you gotta raise them because I want my kids to want to come home for the holidays later on in life. If I haven't done something now to establish that, that emotional connection to the household and dad and mom, uh, I've missed a humongous opportunity. So like I, I realized that if, I, if they're gonna be you know, gone in the world and go, oh, Christmas is coming, I wanna go home, it starts with what I do now. Yeah, I love it. Well, I tell you that that era of dad or that that time of dad focus, I don't know if it goes away. I have a daughter that just moved away to college and I have a daughter that just got married and and I, I still feel that priority and I still want to. Oh, I don't. Yeah, I'm not going to kick him out of the house and I'll talk to him. <laughs> but like traveling when I, yeah. when I hit the road, like I'll be a lot of people be here for like five days, which is totally great. Be here for five days. It just doesn't fit with my season of dad, which yeah. is I go home and I'm taking kids to school in the morning and I'm picking them up and I'm coaching at practice and I'm having meals at the house. So when I look at season of dad for me, it's like business like relation, right? So yeah. I can, if I do work, which I'm a speaker and I travel, like if I was not prioritizing home, I'd be on the road a lot more often than I should. Yeah. So how does this entrepreneurial lifestyle that you've chosen allow you to have this season of dad, to be there when oh, you want to be there for what's really I important? Have, I, people always ask like, what is success? Mm -hmm. And I think success is not freedom, but it's control. And so if you look at like freedom, I can be free to choose a job that I, I hate. I can be free to, to be in a relationship I shouldn't be in. I can be free to, to be overweight, right? But control is a thing that allows me to have the chance to be in season of dad. I can control when I get up, when I take my kid to school, when I bring them home because I control my schedule, I control my income, I control what I say yes and I say no to. So it allows me to have a, a different level of success that I want, which is the control of my life in a way most people don't have. So if I, if I didn't have that, then maybe I'd have to you know, ask for two weeks off to take my son somewhere for his birthday or to take a trip for a track meet or something that may be in a different state, right? And because of what I do, drop the dime like hey let's go and we can sign up and take off immediately because we have control of our lives I love it so would you say that that control is one of the biggest perks of this entrepreneurial lifestyle you, oh, yeah. you teach yeah quite literally the second one would be like impact and fulfillment yeah and there's something special to be said when you do something you love to do that people love that you do and so that's like the second perk the first one is yeah I get to thoroughly enjoy my family and be home that's all matters if I can do if I, made, if I made a billion dollars but I went home to an empty household yeah it'd be worthless that's right that's right okay you have a, a very exciting very uh, eventful journey that you've gone through to get you to where you are today can you tell us a little bit more about that journey yeah so it started in 1986 in I think it was Concord California like Concord or Martinez I'm not quite sure but uh, I was born in 1983, but in 1986, my mom gave me and my three siblings away in a foster care. So it's a very interesting you know, situation of she just didn't want her kids anymore. We got kind of thrust into this very chaotic, heinous environment. Because back then, it's what's called a year paycheck. Which means yeah. As long as you don't die, they get a paycheck for you. So they did everything short of that. You know, I was beaten, I was starved, I was tortured, a lot of weird stuff. I'm so sorry. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's one of those things where I, I don't like that it happened, but I appreciate it. There's that statement that goes, uh, a smooth sea makes not a skilled sailor. Interesting. At this point in my life, I'm, I'm a pretty skilled sailor because I had to navigate some rough seas. But yeah, so I was, when that whole situation, six years old, ended up in my current family. Uh, but interesting thing is I was the only black kid in a, a poor all-white family. It's a lot of dynamics there, just where do I fit? What's my identity? Who am I? And navigate a lot of ups and downs. Finally got adopted at 14. 
So once I got adopted, I had a, like a first place, like I knew, I was like, all right, the place I woke up today, I get to go to sleep tonight for sure. So it was that entrance into a new stage in life and kind of things started anew, but not easy. Yeah. So uh, I'm actually the founder of adoption.com. I spent 25 years of my career working with adoption. Yeah. And um, there's definitely good adoption scenarios and, and bad adoption scenarios. and and. Uh, I feel for you that you spent so long in foster care. There, there's definitely a lot of good foster parents, but there's definitely a lot of, of abuse and, mm -hmm. and unfortunate situations for children there. Um, what advice do you have for maybe kids in foster care, and what advice do you have for, um, for families in, that are bringing in children yeah. from foster care? Great question. So. For the kids in foster care, I think the real big focus should be on letting people love you. Yeah. There's this really interesting emotional wall we put up because the one demographic of mom or dad or aunt or uncle that we want to love us that doesn't, it puts this mar on us. We're like, we don't want anybody else in. This person hurt me, he's the closest to me, and I don't want to have the opportunity to be subjected to that again. Yeah. So next thing you know, you're in a funky place internally and you let nobody in, you let nobody love you. And if you don't let somebody love you, then all you do is just cause havoc and, and cause more anger. That's why 75% of prison inmates in America are former foster kids. Yeah. There's a lot to do with a, an inability to let other people in, and then we want retribution for what's done to us, right? So I think letting people in is a big piece. And then for the parents or the foster parents, or it may be, it's to love the kids past logic, their logic, because in their head, you're just like everybody else. Until it gets to a point where they can't register why in the world you are still here. Like at that moment, I don't know when, it, it could happen at a breakfast when something took place and like you just, you did that one, I have no idea when it'll happen. And it might take years, but there'll be a break where they go, this person legitimately loves me. And the only reason they would is, is you know, or the only reason they can is because I can see what their, their actions, what they've done past anybody else. So it's gotta be something where they just snap out of it and go, wow. I've done all of this and this person is still here. I love it. So to restate, you're talking a lot about atta attachment disorder, right? Mm -hmm. um, people that have attachment issues and, and we've all gone through trauma and, and foster kids by definition have gone through maybe a lot more trauma than, than a yeah, lot of us do. And as a result of the trauma, sometimes we put up these defense mechanisms that, that make it hard for us to accept love, uh, make it hard for us to to maybe uh, be in the healthy, loving relationships that we crave so much that we're wanting more than anything. And, and uh, that advice applies not just for foster kids, but the rest of us. We've, we've really got to let people love us. We've really got to um, love people in spots where they're feeling unlovable. Yeah, 100%. If you don't, then they, they, you're like everybody else. And That's then right. Everybody else gets stay, gets kicked out and they get stay at the edges, but if you can get past that, you get in. Yeah, I love that. Okay, your your consulting practice and your book focus, or your most recent book, focus on identity yeah. shift. Can you tell us a little bit more what you mean by identi identity shift and, yeah. and take us through your your shift method? Yeah, man. So the way that I've always looked at the world, and it's actually probably now more than ever, is we have a, what I call an epidemic of shelf esteem. Everybody's got these books and they buy these things and it goes on a shelf of their house. If you're of the 10% like that do consume stuff, it goes on a shelf of your mind. And maybe less than 1% to 3% of people, in fact, put it into the world, right? So there's this overloading of information. And I found that the issue with people having success is not what they know. If I could ask probably anybody out here right now, hey, what's your dream? They'll tell me and say, do you know what to do? Yeah. Are you doing it? No. <laughs> Right, so it's not a matter of what you, what you know, but it's who you are with what you know. It's the actions you've taken, conscious and subconscious. It's the flow of who you are. And if you go to like a, a neuroscience level, it, in fact, parts of your brain shut off and shut on when I ask who you are, that are your identity. So what I've come to find is your identity is who you are when you are not thinking about who you are. It's how you're living your life. And those actions you take while living your life create your life. Pretty, pretty straightforward. And so when I look at what I'm doing is how do I reprogram that? Because it's a programming. Whether it was teachers, coaches, preachers, leaders, spouse, whatever it was, we're consistently being someone every day that programs us into becoming someone. So when I talk about a shift, it's how can I shift from the current identity that I am 
in the natural flow that it is to a higher level one that in fact can do the things that I need to do actionably to create the life I have in my head. Interesting. Vision, right? So I tell people that if your identity doesn't match your dream, then you don't get the dream. I love that. So, so the shift you're talking about is about not just dreaming something, not just wanting to be something, not just how we see ourselves, but how we're, we're executing that, how we're Here putting it into day-to-day -day action. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a simplification of it, yes. But think about this. Let's say you're in the middle of a, a boxing match, right? Me and you are boxing. And, you know, we... I hope not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm not a big good boxer either, but let's say we're boxing. Me, <laughs> we're going back and forth, and there's a moment where we're both dead tired, yeah. we're both exhausted all energy and options, and we're just going to figure it out. If I identify as a boxer, and you identify as a guy who's trying out boxing, I will beat you. Yeah. And it's not because of physicality, it's because who I am is a person that, it's, when I click into the, the natural overdrive or instinct, I am staying in line with who I see myself to be. Right. I'm a boxer. I must win this. Whereas you're like, I don't know what I'm doing out here. This, this is, a, you know, there's a difference there. And so when you say I'm a mom or I'm a dad and I'm an entrepreneur, what we got to look at is like, how do you identify? Because wherever you identify as, there'll be a moment in time when life hits you with a something, no matter what it is, and you will kick into that instinctual overdrive or whatever it is. And if it doesn't tie into this is who I am, I will fall short. So it's an identification internally that will actually express itself in a way that allows us to get what we want. What advice do you have for us in finding that identity, yeah. how we see ourselves? Well, I don't think you find it. I think there's a, a, a discussion to be had about a biblical identity, right? There, okay. there definitely is. And there's 100% I think it still ties into what I'm about to say. But the idea is like, I don't know if you actually find it, but you create it okay. to, to an extent, right? Because we have free will. Yep. And I think a lot of us don't understand, like when I was, you know, Oh, as a kid, I wasn't a person who identifies, I can do X, Y, and Z, I can play in the NFL, and I can be on television, right? It's not. But in some part of my back of my head, I was like, that would be cool to do. And the question I asked was, well, who do I have to become to do that? Yeah. Or I really actually asked, what does a great ex do? What does a great football player do? A great husband do, right? And so when I could cast that out and say, they do this, this, and this, and, and look at what the actions were, the next thing was like, well, how do I do it and feel like it's who I am. Because one thing to say that that's who I am, but we know in, in the back of our head that that's not who we are sometimes. Yeah. Right? So we don't even go and speak about certain things or talk about stuff because we know, like, ah, it's not my thing. When it's who you are, you'll shout it from the mountaintops. And so for me, it's a matter of how do we, like, how do we get to the point of doing that? And the great question is you first have to figure out what are the components that make up an identity and then compare and contrast to who I see myself as now and what I got going on and say, how do I actually shift into that? How do I become a person that believes at a certain level that this is possible? Or who thinks in line with that identity? Or who takes the action that identity does? Because the biggest thing I've noticed when it comes to like seeing how someone identifies is how do they take on the difficult work? Now, the work, let's say the work is like, you gotta cold call. Let's say the business, you have to cold call, we'll say as an example. Well, there's one person that goes, oh my gosh, I got a cold call because not who they are. The other person goes, it'll feel really weird if I don't cold call today. Yeah. That's who I am. So if that action has to be taken, who do you think is going to succeed? It's the person who's not beating their head against the wall. It's the person who goes, I can't go to sleep at night unless I get 100 cold calls in. Yeah. It's just who I am. I'll, I'll feel worse not doing it than you feel doing it. Therefore, it gets done, and lo and behold, that person's successful. I like how you're talking about creating this identity and for a lot of us maybe we haven't had the role models in our life of who we want to be we didn't have this Russell Brunson amazing entrepreneur as our father that showed us how to be an entrepreneur yeah. right or or maybe we didn't have a father growing up in our foster home that that we want to emulate as in being a father what role do mentors play or how, how do you learn how to create uh, these things that you want in your life well so there's actually the shift method we do, we walk through this, right? So mentors, like I've always, every time I've been successful in life, I had a coach. When I played in the NFL, I had a coach. When I yeah. got, you know, been in business, I've had a coach. I've always had someone that could see the field. I'm really good at seeing what's in front of me, the player, the opposition right here. But I don't see the entire field. It's behind me or it's in my size, right? Yeah. So coaches can come in and go, look, you're doing great there, but you could also do better if you did this, this, and this. So that's yeah. a big thing. And I also believe that the first, like for us, the shift method, the first stage is the C stage. 
I got to see. But it's hard to see the label when you're in the jar. So you need a coach or a mentor to Someone help you. Someone that can see the label in the jar and yeah. go, hey, you're not doing this. You need to do this. And you go, ah, all right, I got to work on that. And that becomes the area in the window. Can you share with us any stories of maybe consulting clients or, or someone else that you've observed that's done this identity shift and, and maybe some success they've achieved yeah, as well? Yeah, so really, uh, what am I like flagship guys? I love him. He's a good dude. His name's Frank. So Frank sold a business. He had a, like a really interesting story of like being like a homeless damn near and like, you know, drugs. And I don't, I don't know if it was drugs. It might have been. It might have been. But uh, he's like, I was in the shower one day and just like life just fell apart and sucked. And I got myself to a point where I built, he built a million dollar business with somebody and they sold it. But the funny thing was he was still hanging on to the identity of the guy who was, you know, like the drunk and had lost his family. He was still, he still saw himself as that. So he identified as the business sale being a, like a, a, a fluke wasn't supposed to happen. Interesting. Very interesting. So when we started working together, it was this thing. We was like making $3,000 a month. It's like, I got this business, I'm doing this stuff and I can't seem to grow it. And so we started unpacking things. It was interesting where he would self-sabotage and not know it because he didn't identify as that guy. So his identity didn't match the dream. He didn't see so himself. So then he couldn't replicate it. Couldn't replicate it. And so when we started kind of clearing that crap out and then leading in by doing the things that that identity does, he messaged me, we had completed our work, and it's a year later, and he goes, hey, I just want to let you know, from the foundation of work that we did and what I've built up since that time frame, he says, I just cleared $1,056,000 sorry, one million fifty six thousand dollars in the business in a year. So that, wow. that, that little shift in identity created a business that's now seven figures. So seeing himself as a successful entrepreneur and not a it's failure. It's a big difference. Yeah. You know, again, we know what to do, but a lot of us aren't doing the thing we're supposed to do, or we'll get to that moment we're supposed to do, and we go, oh, it's not who I am, and we don't. It's like, man, if you just internally realize that the goal is to identify, but in order to identify, have to do the thing that's out of character, which yeah. is the character of the identity, right? Then you nudge a little bit more in that direction, and then lo and behold, the actions turn into outcomes, the outcomes, the ones you want, they re-ingrain the identity and make that shift over time. So yeah, it's, it's, it's as simple, but not as simple as that. Yeah. I think sometimes our, we identify as a failure or something less than what we want to be because of mistakes we've, we've made in our lives. But sometimes we identify in that lesser capacity because of other voices in our lives, other people that are telling us we maybe aren't capable. Mm -hmm. um, what can we do to, to get, the, get rid of those negative voices in our lives and maybe replace them with I don't think that you replace them. I think that they're always there in the head, man. Yeah. It's kind of like a, I always picture like a jury debating, deliberating over like, you know, a thing. And then maybe completely wrong. I've never been in a jury deliberation room, but there's always the voice that's the, the kind voice and, and the loud, angry, you know, negative voice. And I feel like no matter what voice it is, the louder one wins. Like in my head, there's definitely a voice that's like, oh, like you're gonna go on stage today, you might mess up. Other voice goes, no, you're not. It's just louder. It exists. But if you're talking with somebody and they get loud enough, you just stop talking. Yeah. Right? So it's like, I, I don't know if you have to put it in there. I think you just have to make it louder and listen to it. I love that. Okay, so when I give blood, I don't love giving blood and I don't love needles, but I've learned a secret that if I pinch myself mm -hmm. while, so, while blood is give, being taken from me, right, um, I, I cannot feel the needle. There's something about our mind psychologically that the, the, the nerves, you, yeah. you focus, your brain is focusing on the greater pain that you have. Yeah. And um, there's something about our mind where we really can't focus on two things at the same time. We can go back and forth between two things, yeah. but you really can only focus on one thing at once. So what you're saying is you've got you to create the louder voice. You've got to create yeah, the yeah. thing that your mind is focusing on. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you'll, you'll hear about this more today when, we, when I get up and talk about it, but it's, like, it's questions I ask that, that actually are predominant questions that will lead me to that point. And in the moments when I'm having the most difficulty, I simply ask myself, like this morning, I was doing my workout. My trainer makes workouts, he, he texts them to me and I, I do them in the gym because I don't want to think about what to do, I just want to go do it. Yeah. And it wrote one, it was, it was tough, so this morning I'm doing it and in my head I'm like, I want to stop right now. I do not want to do this fourth set. But then in my head I go, okay, well, it's gonna be a version of Anthony on a stage and you know, T minus 10-ish hours. And that guy is gonna be saying something to other human beings about how to do things right and work hard and be of integrity. So what would that Anthony do right now? Yeah. Not what do I wanna do right now? Because right. right now I wanna stop, right? But what does the identity I'm trying to create 
want to do? What would I do right now? Because yeah. once you figure out that that answer, you got to do it. Yeah. And it's not a matter of, of whether or not you enjoy it. Because I think that the second question I always ask is what would make the next moments of my life better? Again, not what do I want to do, but what will be able to make it better? Is it apologizing to my wife in this argument because I'm, I'm wrong? I mean, I want to do it, but it might need to be done, right? Yeah. These little nuances, but those things, if you lead in with them, the more you do them, the more comfortable you get with living in line with that identity. It becomes who you are if you've done it enough. In your book, you talk. You have a chapter titled, What Promise? Mm -hmm. Right? You want to yeah. tell us a little bit about what that chapter is I like is that about? you read it. I don't know you read it. I haven't read the whole thing. You but. read that chapter. It's good. So... The, the, is a question was posed to me by a guy that lives out here, actually, named J.R. Reed, former baseball player. We hopped on a, one of those, you know, simple, hey, catch up 15 minute calls, meet you real quick. And the first question he asked, he says, what promise did God make for the world when he created you? And I was like, that's a really interesting question for 10 o'clock in the morning yeah. at Starbucks, bro. <laughs> and so it really settled with me of like an interesting question that I continue to ask myself. And so I, as I was asking and battling with it, like, what do you, what's the answer? I was like, I wonder what other people's answers are. So now on my podcast, I ask that question, but it's one that I, I put in the book that I think we should spend time is what promise was made to the world. Because I think that promise isn't a matter of just what do you do, it's who are you being for the world. Yeah. Right, it's not I made the, the pet rock, you know, it's like who are you as a human being every day in this world we are? Because there's a promise that was created for your life and that promise wasn't just for what your output was, it was who you are every day as your input. Yeah. So that's the question that I ask in the book. Thank you so much, Anthony, for sharing your stories and insights with us today. Here are some of my key takeaways from this episode. Number one, a smooth sea never made a skilled sailor. The challenges we face help us become better versions of ourselves. Number two, if our current identity doesn't match up with our dream, we won't get our dream. Number three, to have an identity shift, we first need to see the person we want to become. Number four, mentors and role models can help us determine what we need to do to get where we want to be. Number five, we often have to do things that are out of character in order for it to eventually become part of our character. Number six, while we may not be able to get rid of the negative voices, we can be louder than them with our positive voices. And number seven, entrepreneurship can give us control, freedom, and fulfillment. To learn more about or connect with Anthony, you can check out his book on Amazon, visit his website at anthonytrucks.com, or connect with him on LinkedIn and Instagram. And there's links to each of those sites in the blog post for this episode at monetizationnation.com. You can also get a free copy of my ebook about passion marketing and learn how to become a top priority of your ideal customers at passionmarketing.com. You can also subscribe to Monetization Nation on YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, our Facebook group, and on your favorite podcast platform. Thanks for joining me for this episode. I wish you success in overcoming your past and having an identity shift. Do you want to become a better digital monetizer? To receive great monetization stories and secrets, please go to monetizationnation.com and join free. And if you liked today's episode, please subscribe to the show and share it.